Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast. Today, we're going to talk about the evolution of data center from classic Ethernet to BXLAN. Thank you so much for everybody who's joining us today. We hope you really learn a lot from this session. My name is Hilda Artiaga, and I'm going to be the host of today's session. So before we start, I would like to share with you something about us. So the Cisco Support Community is an online forum with over half a million members where you can get answers to your technical questions prior to opening cases with the TAC. There, you can also make many questions, contribute, write documents, videos, or blogs. Remember that the community is a place that can help you to boost your career by becoming a top contributor and getting the technical community to know about your expertise. So before we start with this event, I would like to share with you some of the news and upcoming events that we have here in the community. Here in this session, we will have an Ask the Expert event following this webcast. This means that if you have any questions regarding this technology and all the technologies that Tiago will be presenting, because actually there will be a lot talking about data center evolution, if you have any questions regarding ACI, VXLAN, VPC, or any of these technologies that he will be presenting, you can make all these questions on the forum related to this event that is allocated at the community. This event will have place till Friday, May 25th. Sorry about that. So if you have any questions after this uh, event, please don't forget to join and make any questions to Tiago, who will be there to respond everything. And also, for all of you among the audience who can speak different languages, if any of you can speak Spanish, we would like to invite you to another Ask the Expert event that we have currently at the community, at the Spanish community. This is about the best practices, configuration, and troubleshooting for Nexus 7K. This will be available to Friday, the 1st of June, and Gustavo and Ramon will be there to help you to solve all your questions regarding this event. This event is open to all customers and partners from Cisco, and please feel free to make all of your questions, and they will be able to answer them. Also, we would like to invite you to become an event top contributor. Uh, to become an event top contributor, you just can answer different questions on the forum from other members, or you can post documents or videos, or you can share simply all the knowledge that you have here in the community. Uh, by becoming a, a top contributor, you can get access to different programs that we have, and you can be recognized not only by the community, but also by all the technical audience around the world. So also, we would like to invite you to take some time to write the content that is on the community. Why is it important to write the, 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 the content that is on the community? Well, it's very easy. It not only helps us to identify quality content, but it also helps us to tell this person that is helping us out or to tell this person who created a document or a video, thank you very much for, for everything you have shared with. It's very useful or it's very helpful. How can we do that? It's actually very easy and it not really takes you like a long of time. So what you have to do is every time you face a an answer that is very very helpful to the question that you did, you just can give a helpful vote. Just at the bottom, you will have this uh, blue star, uh, and then you just can give a helpful vote if that answer helped you out. Or you can either accept it as a solution if that really helps you to solve out your problem. Also, if you find a video, a document, a blog that is very good, please help us to, to qualify and rate it as a good one, because that helps us identify it as a good, and it helps us to increase the participation of the community. And also, for those who are familiar with the Cisco Support Community and communities.cisco.com, we have a great news to share that we are going to merge this summer, and I paste uh, some information on the chat for, for all of you. Uh, this is going to be great, because we will be only one community. Precisely. So in the upcoming events, we are going to be only one community for all of you. So thank you very much, Monica, for sharing that news with us. To don't lose more time, I would like to um, say, first of all, thank you to Tiago Silva, who has been joining and who is joining with us today to be the presenter for, for today. Thank you very much, Tiago, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to tell all the audience uh, about you, Thiago. So basically, Thiago Silva is a network consulting engineer with over 15 years of experience in the IT industry area. Uh, he currently works at Cisco's global service provider in Montreal, Canada. Thiago has experience in several IT fields such as transport networks, security, wireless, and LAN and WAN. 
However, in the last year, he has focused more on the service provided and data center technologies. He has worked out in Embratel, Alstom, Capgemini, and AMA, which is Aeroplan. Tiao holds a bachelor's degree in information technology and telecom technician degree. He has also several certifications such as CCNA Wireless, CCNA Security, CCDP, CCNP, routing and switching, and CCIA on data center. So, as you may see, we have a great expert for today, and we hope we can learn a lot from him. And also with us today is Jiao Daniel. Uh, Jiao is a network engineer with 18 years of experience in the network area. He currently works for professional, service, professional services based in Sao Paulo. However, he uh, works remotely from Brazil's Northeast. He's an expert in routing and switching and service provider with a lot of experience in enterprise in LAN and one data center network and service provider backbone. However, since the last year, he focused on service provider backbone projects from medium and large service providers. He has worked from Banco Pradesco, Delsync, which is Sonda ATI, Capital Money, and Dimension Data Brazil as a solution architect. He holds a computer engineering degree and Jao has several certifications as well, such as CCNA, routing and switching, CCNP, routing and switching, CCDA, CCDP, and two CCIAs, one in routing and switching and one in service provider. Thank you so much, Joao, for being with us today. It's such a pleasure and an honor to have you here. So I hope you enjoy this session as much as we do. No problem. Okay, so for all of you who are interested in today's presentation, you can find all the slides in the community. They're available. You can review them. You can check out one by one, slide by slide, and review all the details that Yahoo is going to be sharing with us today. And also, for all of you who haven't been with us uh, on a webcast before, so the process is like this. I'm going to be completing all this presentation and introduction. Then Tiago is going to be sharing with us all the details. During the session, you, you can make questions at all time, including from now. And at the end, we will read aloud some of the questions that you submit out on the Q&A panel. So something very important that I would like to just to clarify, and I would like to give some push is that, please, if you have any technical question or any question related to all the topics that Tiago is presenting, please help us to allocate this question on the Q&A panel. For all of you who are on a desktop or laptop, you can find it at the right top or at the down in just a drop-up menu. So it's called Q&A, so please uh, place all your technical questions on all the questions related to the session there. So in that way, Joao, who is the question manager for this session, can help us to submit this question, to answer to these questions, and also uh, we can help you out to, to really find a, an answer for them. And for all of you who have technical issues or you are having any logistic issues, like you are not having audio, uh, your presentation frees out, or you are having issues with WebEx, please contact us via the chat, okay? So the recording of today's presentation will be available in the following days, such as uh, all the presentation and everything here. So thank you very much again for joining us today. We hope you learn a lot from this session and you hope you really, really enjoy. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the mic into Tiago. So Tiago, please share with us everything that you have and thank you very much again for being with us today. Hello everyone and welcome to joining us. So as Ilda was presenting us, uh, my name is Tiago. I'm working for Cisco in the past year already. And today's session will be about evolution of data center, classical Ethernet to v VXLAN. Okay. So I'd like to start this with a simple phrase from James Collins saying, innovation without discipline leads to disaster. So when we talk about evolution, we always need to keep in mind that Please let's be uh, let's think about what we are doing and plan better to avoid big disasters, mainly with our data centers, customers calling us during the night. You know how it works. So today's agenda: uh, a little bit of introduction about us, about data center uh, evolution of data center topologies. Uh, during this, I'll be presenting new technologies, IPC, VXLAN. That some of them are already in the market for some years, but uh, for some can be still new, can still be new. Uh, I'll be presenting some troubleshooting tips, some things that help us during the daily activities. And also I'll be doing a demo about VXLAN and together with the troubleshooting tips, I'll be doing demos on troubleshooting. This is me, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, when you download the, 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 
presentation, you're going to be able to, to keep track of my LinkedIn account. Feel free to add me there. Uh, as I said, I'm a network consulting engineer for Cisco, working on the global service provider team. Uh, I have some certifications. Uh, my last one is my CCIE data center last December. Long journey. I really encourage you guys uh, to go through it. It's worth, you're going to learn a lot. I also have with me my colleague, Joel, John Daniel. He'll be the, the question manager. Every time that you send a question, he'll be the one dealing with them, uh, filtering down and check if I can help you with it or not. He'll be able to answer some also. I had the pleasure to work with John for some years when I was still in Brazil. Uh, we worked on the engineering team there, and he also well qualified CCIE routing switching, CCIE service provider, as you already explained, besides the CDP and CDP routing switching. So, John, John, thank you very much for helping me on this. It's my pleasure, Thiago. Just to start, guys, I'm going to ask you, so uh, the guys who will help me with this, go to your Q&A panel. Uh, let's start with this. Which technology are you running on your data center today? Classical Ethernet, like just spanning tree, no fancy stuff. If you have VPC, Fabric Path, VXLAN, or even ACI, who knows? So answer that for us. It's going to help us to guide us during this presentation. Uh, and that's it. Basic stuff, guys. What is a data center? Okay, data center. We we have this pyramid. Like we have the data center foundation, data center services, and user services. Uh, one thing that I like to separate is data center is not only a server room with a lot of uh, f fancy lights blinking. We need to think as a data center of an environment able to provide a lot of services, of course. So in the data center foundation, we have the routing part, the switching. We also have storage, compute, uh, that we can add uh, ser some services to the data center, like virtualization, application resiliency, uh, security part. But for our customers, for our users, what really matters is, do we have web? Do we have email? Can I access? my personal calendar, can I dial someone? So to make everything works for the user, we need a data center foundation. And that's where our focus will be today. I'm going to first, feel free to post some questions and some chats also. What a data center needs to offer, okay? First of course, availability. Uh, a user needs to be able to access their servers, their services also. So. If someone wants to go to the web, the data center needs to provide that information. If a user needs to, to dial your, your other customer, the, it, it, he doesn't want to listen, hey, uh, we are out of service for now, please dial back in 30 minutes, whatever. So data center needs to be available. and also needs to be scalable. Okay. Uh, it's common to find places that you just buy one or two servers or switches, and in the end, when the business starts growing, you won't be able to grow, so your data center cannot increase capacity and it's not scalable, which brings us to flexibility, which it doesn't matter which services we are going to deploy, we need to be able to deploy that. If it's a big data, if it's a web uh, server, or if it's a file server, a data center needs to be flexible enough to provide that. Efficiency, uh, because, of course, you don't want to wait 20 minutes, 10 minutes to download uh, all your emails from the day. You need to connect and download it right away. So it needs to be efficient. Predictability. So am I growing the correct path? Do I have enough capacity to get there? Uh, what is going to happen with the new projects when they come? So predictability, your data center needs to be able to provide you that. And reliability, do you trust your data center? And why I emphasize this is, imagine you are working in a data center with redundant devices and you have active standby or active active uh, switches, and you go to a change management board asking, hey, I want to reboot my secondary switch. And your manager is going to ask, say, no, we need to do this overnight because it's not reliable. Uh, well, you need to trust our data center. 
you are investing technology, you are deploying it, you make sure that you need to make sure that it works. Uh, and of course, we are talking about planned maintenance. What about if we wanna if we have a failure? So a data center needs to be reliable. Okay. One thing that I like to mention again: Do you think about? Do you think in everything that a data center needs? Because it's easy to get to a network guy and say, "Hey, I'm going to deploy a new Nexus switch with Nexus switch with ACI VXLAN, but I don't know. Like I'm putting in enough money on this. I'm not thinking about part density. Does my application needs buffer capacity? Am I going to have enough table size, like MAC address uh, table size, to everything that I'm going to deploy? Uh, do I have low latency, cut through service switching? So everything you need to think. And if you are working as an architect, or even if you're running on the ongoing team, you need to be able to report this. Hey, we are increasing this. We have problems with buffer. And we even got to the point thinking about ECMP. ECMP is a new common term, equal cost multipath. So instead of having only one path to all, all your flows, you need to be able to load balance. You need to be able to have more bandwidth and redundancy. And last but not least, multi-tenancy. Uh, so when you think multi-tenancy and you think about data center, people think, yeah, I'm going to be a big data center provider that I'm going to uh, allow services for multiple customers. But we need to bring more tenancy in-house. We need to bring that to your own company, even if you, own, if you don't sell data center services. Let's say you have a production environment and you have a pre-prod and you have a dev environment. You don't want this traffic to merge between them. You don't want to apply the same policies uh, to them. And you have different teams working on different uh, projects. So when we talk about multi-tenancy, this can also be something that you need to think in-house, like even, let's say, small companies. Okay? So think out of the box when you're deploying a data center. In the high level, data center services, if we go to the, the data center foundations part, this is what we have. So we have some blocks saying unified computing. A data center is not only switches. Data centers also servers can be UCSB, like UCS Blade servers, UCSC, uh, rack servers directly, uh, interconnecting with fabric oh, with FIs or, or fabric interconnects. You can have a storage. Uh, you have the SAN network. Uh, you have in the middle the fabric, and fabric is a new term for your core. Let's say uh, it's before you use it to have. A, layers, and now it's just called fabric. We are going to go deeper on this later on this slide. So you have the fabric, which basically the core of the data center and running all the switches. Uh, and then you also have the inter-data center networking. Of course, people need to connect to the data center. It's not something that you keep on, on, on a room and no one's going to get there. You need to think about private cloud. You need to think about public cloud. This means internet, MPLS connections, uh, direct links, like if you want to learn to learn with customers or other buildings, you need to be able to connect that and distribute that on the data center. Uh, with a solution like this, you need to be able to manage that properly. You need to have VPN, tunnels, firewalls. Uh, you need to have uh, like jump servers to your operation team to connect to that environment. Uh, and the reason I'm putting this in a separate block is you don't want to have a problem for a data center. Uh, let's say you lost the OSPF, you, your routing is not working fine. How you're going to connect remotely? It's not easy sometimes to drive uh, 30 minutes, one hour, even five hours to your hosting site. So you need to have on a separated compartment for your management part. Uh, and you also need to think about DNS, LDAP, by browsing, so you can patch your devices, so you can provide FTP to your switches when they, you are implementing some upgrades. And that's a, like a high level view of a data center. This brings us to the point, do you think about everything? Okay, 
and the reason I'm asking this again is, let's say you have uh, a UCS blade and you're going to deploy VMware. When, you're, you know, when you deploy VMware on the UCS blade, you need to have not only one NIC card, you need more than one backup, uh, NIC card. Because you need backup links, you need interfaces to transport your backup traffic, you need uh, management interfaces. And we can extend that to your VMs. We can extend that to a lot of places, which means when you have a data center with a thousand VMs, you don't you don't have only a thousand IPs or a thousand MAC addresses. You can go to three, four thousand MAC addresses. Okay. Now think that a little bit bigger. If we, if you are a data center provider. This can multiply a lot and this can grow. So that's why I asked in the beginning, are you thinking about table sizing? Are you thinking about uh, uh, everything? So keep that in mind, in mind when we continue the discussion. Okay, results here, classical internet, VPC. We have some people using VPC, cool. ACI, nice to see that. Nice to see ACI there. Okay, guys. So let's start with evolution of data center topologies. Okay. When I say evolution, for some it might be really basic, but it's it's good to, to start growing from scratch. When everything started, we just had one router, one switch, all servers connected to the switch. What happens if the switch is down? So you have a high risk, high risk, okay. And the router was doing all the layer three part and everything was being routed through it. If you have traffic from one server to the other one, you have what we called router nice stick. So all the traffic was sent to the router, sent back to the switch. So you also have high utilization on the uplinks. Uh, that's not good. So someone thought, yeah, let's add another switch. And we split the servers between the switches but we didn't think about the router yet. So if the secondary switch is down, no problem. But what if the primary switch is down? So we increase, we reduce a little bit the risk, but we still have single points of failure. We increase a little bit the manage, management, but it doesn't solve the issue. So let's go further and add a secondary router so we think about first hop redundancy protocol. And what this is, HSRP, VRP, GLBP. So this is going to, to provide you some redundancy. If the first switch fails, you have the secondary one uh, going to the, to the internet, but you still have some problems thinking about uh, layer two, layer three label, uh, layer. So everything that's going to be routed needs to go up to the router and come back. You reduce the risk, but you still have some things, some issues. I'm going fast, guys, because like Ilda said, we have some topics. So I want to focus on VXLAN at the end. So this is just to show to you why we are getting to VXLAN, why we need VXLAN, okay? We increase redundancy on the server side also. We can add a secondary port to the switch, but the server, this interface will be and use it. So it's going to be, you increase the cables, but think those cables as they're not in use right now. So they can be in use for one year or one day if you have a problem. Oh, and then we start over utilizing the switches and we need to add more switches. And then that's where our issues start growing more and more and more. Because think about this. You have just switches, redundant, everything redundant, etc. But you need to extend a VLAN from one switch to the other one because you want to, you want to have the service on the same VLAN. What's going to happen with regular spuddy tree, which we call classical Ethernet, let's say, is a lot of things, a lot of links will be blocked. So you put a lot of money on cabling. You put a lot of money increasing device ports, but they're not in use. Uh, of course, someone can, add, can, can say, hey, 
uh, I can play with the VLANs. I can distribute the, the VLANs, point, putting the force switch as a primary for VLAN 1 to 100 and the other VLANs 200 to 300, you know, uh, on the secondary switch. But still, you're not using all the cables for all the VLANs in the same time. So you have a lot of problems. And then we have a bigger layer 2 domain. What happens if we start a broadcast? What happens if we have a, uh, some issue and we have a loop? So this is going to be uh, a pain to maintain that. That's why we don't want to increase that. And of course, we still have the issue with the routing on top. We get to mostly what we have today. We have the layers, we have the core switches running layer three, everything bring to, to closer to the routers, sorry, to the servers. But we reduce one thing, we reduce what we called mobility. Okay. And mobility means I need to have all the VLANs on the same switch, the same pair. If I extend this to the other one, I can't because I have just layer three between the guys. And I'm pretty sure that most of you guys already saw someone, some manager saying, hey, I don't care. Please extend this layer to this VLAN from this pair of switches on the left to the pair of switches on the right. And then you start creating a mess, right? Managing layer three, extending layer two. So all the problems that you had before, you start having again and increases the, the management part, that, which is not good. We got to end that we have what we call a class topology. Okay. So class topology, forget about what we had here. Like we have access layers, we have distribution layers, we have core layers on the top. We have everything like that, and mostly of, most of the places are implemented that way. Now, what everyone is aiming to use, and this is the target, it's a class topology. It's what we call leaf spine leaf traffic. All the traffic will never go from one switch to another switch directly without crossing only one leaf. And having this, to be able to have this, actually, we need to have some technology deployed here. We can have Fabric Path, we can have VXLAN, we're going to demonstrate later, but what, what is the benefit of this? Mainly when we have this, we have ECMP, equal cost. This means that our uplinks, my, my, my hops to the next point, will always be one hop done. And we have uplinks with the same uh, cost. So I can easily load the traffic between the two switches. And with this said, I don't have any link blocky, blocked. So all the links, all the money that I put in cabling, uh, I'm using it. And we, bring, we go back to the, the, to the questions, do you think, think about everything? Yes, I'm putting my money in something that I'm using. I'm putting my money in something that I can rely on. And if I want to grow, it's much, much easier because I don't need to worry about uh, spreading tree and exciting everything like that. I just add one device, put cables to the spine, all devices will be connected to this device via the spines. So what we call the scale out, we scale to the right side, we just increase the number of ports, for example. And what we, if we want to increase bandwidth, so scale up, we increase the spines, number of spines. Depending on the technology, we have a limitation, but we can increase two, three, four spines easily. If I need to increase bandwidth, I can just change 10, 40, 100 gig link on the uplinks. So this type of topology, it's much, much easier to manage. But to be able to do, to do that, you need to use some technologies, right? Let's start with first thing. VPC, okay? For those who doesn't know, I'm just putting a lot of acronyms here on the, on the screen, but I, what I, I want to explain to you what is VPC about. 
uh, remember that we had a server connected only to one side of the switch. And when we added the second side, we had a link blocked, right? Uh -huh. What then? Remember that you you had in some cases. You're, you, you're probably asking, okay, I don't VPC isn't the same thing like like stack, like VSS and Catalyst switches. Uh, it's not because when we have VPC, you can put a secondary link to another switch. These switches, so the VPC pairs, they are completely isolated so they have their their plane plane they have their control plane uh, if you have a problem with a uh, spiny tree in one it won't affect the other side okay if we have a problem with spiny tree in a stack all the switch is dead on vss you have a mix of uh, control plane as well so vpc brings that possibility to us having two different switches completely isolated to seems like one single switch to the endpoint. Okay. And how do we do that? So first of thing, first of all, you create pairs of switches. Okay. VPC only works in pairs. Uh, just already answering a question that already got some times. Uh, you cannot have a, ter uh, a third box here to work in VPC. They're always in pairs. Okay. And each switch is known as VPC peer. Uh, so to make the peers work, first thing is you need what we call VPC peer keep alive link. This peer keep alive link, it's a layer three connectivity between the boxes. You won't have any traffic on it. So it doesn't need to be like 100 gig, uh, multiple, a lot of port channels. You just need to make sure that you have layer three connectivity between the switches. The best part to do it, the best way to do it uh, is, the best way to do it is use a dedicated layer three interface on the Nexus switches, okay? So you can go to uh, Ethernet 1.1, but no switchboard, and we are going to get to the configuration part after, but you can use the layer three, a dedicated layer three interface on the Nexus port just to be part of the peer link. Okay, uh, you don't need to route this uh, through your core. You can be a slash thirty between these two devices. Okay. After that, you need a VPC peer link. Okay, don't make a keep alive link, which is only keep alive traffic, just hellos with VPC peer link. VPC peer link is really a port channel uh, that you need a minimum of a 10 gig link. It's recommended a port channel. Uh, this is going to carry traffic between the VPCs peers when needed. And it's also going to replicate ARP tables uh, and a lot of uh, like ARP requests, everything between the boxes using what we call CFS, so Cisco Fabric Services Protocol. So they're going to synchronize uh, information between them, check if they're well configured, which we are going to see in a moment also. Uh, just to make sure here, we normally have the, the device, in this case a blade, connected with VPC member ports. So it's a port connected to, to, to from each VPC peer to the device in the end. It's called member port and we configure VPC. So the virtual port channel, if you check only one device, you only have one interface, but it's really for the device in the end, it's really two, okay? We, of course, we can have orphan ports with orphan devices, and don't mix what we call orphan device, which is a device using a VPC VLAN, so it's a VLAN used by VPC links, with a device that is single connected, but is not running VPC, not using any VPC VLAN. So orphan devices are devices using only the VPC, is connected to only one side, running on a VLAN used by VPC, okay? Steps, and I put this 
in a single slide because this is really, really important, guys. First of all, create a VPC domain. And by VPC domain, remember, it's a pair of switches. What if we have one VPC domain here and another VPC domain here, and, the, and you are extending layer two between them? So when having this as a VPC domain, configure the VPC, VPC domain on top with one number, let's say 10, and the secondary one with a secondary number, let's say 20, don't use the same, okay? So first, just that, that's just a tip, some of the best practices. Uh, so first, create VPC domain, establish peer keep alive connectivity, then you create a peer link, and only after you create the VPCs. And as we can continue here, we're going to see on the demo after how to see these outputs. I just want to make sure that we have this on the presentation so you can follow up later. So to configure VPC, to create VPC domain, you need to first create a, enable the feature. For those that doesn't know, Nexus is, uses what we call features. If you are not using VPC on your device, if you're not using OSPF or any other feature, why you should have the CPU processing those packets or you have that process running. So if you don't enable feature VPC, you won't even have the commands available to continue the configuration. So that's how you make the, the, the process or the CPU utilization uh, better on Nexus, okay? So you need to first enable feature VPC. You need to create, put a VPC domain number and that's where I was telling you guys, for each pair on a layer two domain, put a different VPC domain number, okay? And that's it. You can, it's already, you already enabled and created the VPC domain. And if you check show VPC row, in the end, you should, it's, you, you have VPC system Mac. There's my address here. It's going to be used, it's going to be seen on the end device. And we are going to see it in a moment. Uh, this is going to be the same MAC address for both boxes. So that's how you're going to tell your edge device here, hey, I'm in the same box. Because for him, on a layer two perspective, I only have one uh, port channel neighbor, okay? Uh, the other uh, MAC addresses that are different, they're going to be used for non-VPC traffic if you want to run uh, regular spuddy tree, not using VPC. Go to the VPC peer keep alive link or PKL. So again, it's a hard bet between VPC through layer three connectivity. Best practices, guys. Layer three connect connectivity directly between these two. Uh, you can extend uh, via a layer two switch let's say using the management interface, for example. But one heads up that I want to give you is, let's say you have a, a, a Nexus 7K and you have two supervisors. They're going to share the same management IP on the supervisor. If you have that, you need to make sure that both links are well connected to your layer two switch. So that's why we don't recommend using management interface directly. Also, keep in mind when you are on the data center and some guy is doing maintenance there, he's going to see, oh, this is only management. I can easily move the cables without any impact. And if you have the peer link there, just the peer link down, no problem. But if, if you have two issues at the same time, uh, you may have a big issue. So a management interface, don't use that recommendation. You can use it, but not recommend it directly. Uh, of course, people also ask, can I route this through my core? Yes, you just need layer three reachability, but that would be the worst case scenario. You don't want to rely your data center, your VPC peers through your uh, OSPF because, or through your any routing protocol 
because you you're adding more problems there if you have something okay some issue so easily how to configure peer keep alive you just say my destination which is my peer ip and my source ip reverse on the other side and you have reachability between them okay the peer keep alive link on top of UD, uh, udp if someone is interested enough knowing that uh, which interface we are running in this case, and it's going to see that the peer is alive. This is the most important po important part when configuring VPC peer keep alive links. As soon as you configure this, they are going to start checking, hey, are you there? And this needs to be alive, this needs to be success. Okay? Three, peer VPC peer link. Created the, v the VPC peer link, OPL. So this would be a dot one kill trunk and you need to carry all your VPC VLANs there. Let's say you have a UCS blade running VMware or Hyper-V and you have 100 VLANs there that you want to connect to have it, this blade dual connected. You need to make sure that all, all those VLANs are allowed on the trunk, okay? And you don't want to run this, you don't want you to, to allow the VLAN of the peer keep alive link if you decide to use that using this uh, peer link, so you need to block it. Also, remove all the VLANs that are not VPC. And uh, so remember that when we, we may have devices that they are not forming port channels or they are using a VPC VLAN, so the same VLAN available on the on the UCS blade, but I have only a, a capability to connect to one device, so that would be an orphan device. But we can also have the, the, thing, the, the, the case that a device doesn't need to be on the VLAN of a, that is used by a VPC, so we should remove that VLAN also from the peer. Uh, just to answer a question that's probably sh going to show up, what do I do about these VLANs? Recommendation, you should add a secondary layer 2 link between the Nexus and only run on, the, on top of those, those layer 2, the non-VPC VLANs, okay? Uh, answering your question quickly uh, that I got, we have the peer link and we have the peer keep alive link. If only one of them fails, there is no problem. If we have the, the peer link fail, the, the devices will be able to forward because they can see each other via, via peer keep alive link. Uh, so we still have traffic going through. Uh, the biggest problem, uh, and the, the peer keep alive, uh, uh, the, the VPC peer link, what's going to happen also if it's go down the, the, the secondary box is going to shut down the ports that are dual connected, which means I still have traffic. I won't uh, shut down the other link, the, the other device, but I won't allow traffic to go through all that link. But if we lose both links, peer link and peer keep alive link, then we may have a problem which we call split brain uh, basically, both devices won't see the peer link, the, the, the other the other side, and it's going to believe that's running alive. So we may have traffic impact due to mismatch of uh, of flow and these things. Okay, back to the configuration part. VPC peer link is just a regular port channel that we add to the line VPC peer link. And we do this on both sides. Okay. Uh, we carry a spinning tree. We carry we, we carry their HSRP, HMP, ARP, all these things. We transfer between them using the, the peer link. Okay. As soon as we configure that, and we are not going up to creating the VPC directly. As soon as we just create the VPC peer link, uh, and we run show VPC, that's something we should see. Okay. Device 46, 45, 46, we have them. They, are, they have a JSNC, the peer is alive, so peer keep alive link is, is good. 
peer status is okay. Everything is matching. So we have this guy working as the primary, this guy working as the secondary. This is not for traffic flow. This is for uh, VPC uh, management, let's say. So we have which are the VLANs allowed on the peer link. So these are the VLANs that we are traffic uh, carrying. So this is basically, remember when I always say, say we have the VPC VLANs, these are the VPC VLANs allowed there. Okay, you can easily see with the show VPC output. We have VPC domain created, we have peer keep alive, we have peer link, now let's create a VPC. So again, you create a part channel, regular part channel, you create as you want the VLANs that are going to be implemented there, and you just say VPC and put a number. In the peer device, there's a typo here, don't worry, it's 46, but on the peer device, you also need to use the same VPC number. Okay, so when you see here, you have port channel 36, it's up with these VLANs, they're going to show up on both sides. And remember that I mentioned to you that VPC MAC address? So here it is. When I go to the edge switch, so this device in the bottom, okay, we have show LACP neighbor and see the system IT. They are the same. So for this device, I have a, a LACP neighbor running on my port channel that I put as number 36 on this device. And I say this on two different interfaces, but in reality, Ethernet 121 is going to leave 45, and Ethernet 122 is going to leave 46, which should be here on the right. So two different physical devices, different data planes, different control planes, but for my bottom switch, it's the same. Okay, so this is VPC uh, flow, VPC configuration. Some best practices. Don't use VPC peer link IP using the peer link. And this is what I meant about if you want to configure this via VLAN, the peer link via VLAN, like a SVI, don't allow that on the peer link. Because if you have a problem with the peer link, uh, you will lose also the peer keep alive. So you may have a problem. Uh, typo here, sorry. Uh, we use LACP always. When available, it's, it helps on the graceful failover and misconfiguration protection. Uh, different VPCs, uh, if you're extending uh, layer two between VPC pairs. Answering questions also, always connect a nerf device to the primary uh, because if the peer link is down, orphan devices or ports that are single connected to the secondary device will be shut down. And enable peer switch for fast bunny tree convergency. Oh, heads up. VPC is supposed to reduce to reduce the, the blocking paths, right? Because you won't be it's going to overcome the the, the, the spunny tree thing that normally blocks uh, dual path, dual redundancy. Uh, but in reality it's really running spunny tree in the back but the bottom device not seeing that. So that's why we say enable peer switch to allow fast reconvergency because that, that's going to be able to send traffic in both directions and uh, on the expenditure conversion to if you have any problem. Follow the link also. You have a big PDF with 100 pages and more about best practice. I really recommend you guys reading that. So, 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 so doesn't know we also have some uh, breakout sessions available on Cisco Live, ciscolive.com. Uh, it's free, you just connect there, register yourself, and you're going to see a lot of presentations here about, uh, a, lot, about a lot of slides here mentioning uh, Cisco Live presentations. Just search by the name. Don't need to put the full name, just the, the name number. You're going to see the presentations for different years, okay? You guys know about Fabric Path? Thiago. Let's start. Yep. Uh, there's one good question here. Could you answer, please? Uh, how to troubleshoot sure. is VPC is down peer VLAN consistency status? 
if VPC is if the peer link is down. Uh, Say again, sorry. Peer VLAN consistency status. Status. Uh, such, yeah, as shown as stated. Okay. okay, this uh, one. So basically, with this consistent, this show VPC, and I'm going to show you on the demo after. But basically, on this, uh, using the CFS protocol running through the peer link, they're going to see how each side is configured. So which VLANs do I have there? Are those VLANs, uh, let's say I have VLAN 1700 allowed on one side, but it's not allowed on the other side. I'm going to see consistency uh, status failed, okay? And you can check show VPC consistency parameters one by one, you're going to see that. And so that's the, the thing. Uh, Answer if it does, if it doesn't answer we can go back to the this on the end uh, no don't worry fabric path so well, fabric path will be the 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 first topology the first technology to use the class topology okay so remember spine leaf connectivity so basically basically fabric path it's a mix of switching and routing. Okay, you run layer three, layer two, and layer three together, uh, and you can easily extend VLANs. And in the core, you won't run spanning three at all. Okay, and that's what I mentioned here. Before we had access distribution in the core layer, when we bring to the class topology in the fabric path fabric you will never see a VLAN going through this. Okay, if you, you can run show spiny tree, you see no spiny tree here. And how this magic happens is you have ISIS running on the background. Okay, so it's e really easily, really easy to, to implement. I'm going to show you the steps, but you just enable your fabric interfaces on the fabric path as a fabric path interface, switch port mode fabric path, and you establish the neighbor between these guys. And what type of things fabric path solves? And that's where the, the point that we say max scaling. Okay. Remember the, uh, the first question that I asked you guys, is your data center ready to expand? Like, is it scalable? Do you, are you concerned about max sizing? Mac table sizing, and then I said we can grow a lot of Mac utilization. If you have a bridge domain, if you have a, a, a layer two domain, and a device sends a, a layer two broadcast, like hey, I'm going to the network, I'm connecting out to the network, all the switches, all devices, they are going to see that Mac address on their Mac address table, even if I don't have traffic to that. If I had a broadcast on the on layer two, I'm going to see that device and I'm going to use my MAC address table with that. So with Fabric Path, we start we start having uh, MAC scaling. So I'm only going to add that MAC address on my MAC address table if I really need to talk with it. So let's say I have the server connected here, and it's going to send a broadcast. Uh, I'm, uh, layer two packet or any device and packet to another server connected here. I'm going to send this via ISIS and fabric path. I'm going to ask my my root devices, let's say, we get to the point in a moment, hey, which leaf has this MAC address? And then the packet will, will flow directly. So leaf spine directly to that. And I can, if I have a thousand servers connected to these devices and only ten devices connected to this one, I won't have high utilization MAC address table here. What Fabric Path also add is equal cost ECMP. So all the links are always active, so I don't have spinning tree blocking and link here. Okay. And I also I'm also able to connect to classical Ethernet. So if I have old switches, if I'm migrating to Fabric Path, uh, don't worry about it. I'm able to connect 
to this classical Ethernet uh, cloud, let's say. Configure it. Again, remember that I explained about features with the VPC. Some things are even further that we have to install the feature set, fabric path, we have to have the license, we enable this, and we enable the feature, and only then we start configuring switch IDs. So my MAC address table will be, hey, I need to send packet to this MAC address. The guy will say, my next hop is switch 202. And I'll forward to 202. I don't need to know which is the device in the end. I just need to send the packet to my switch ID that I define here. I configure root priority also. Uh, so the, the main devices that are going to control multicast traffic, broadcast, what we call boom, broadcast, unicast, uh, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic. So the boom traffic will be managed by the, the root devices. And we create the VLANs and we enable the fabric ports. Okay. So fabric domain, root priority. And then I'll just add a tip here. Normally what we do is we have the spines using two digits. We have the leaves using three digits. But remember VPC? VPC uh, on Fabric Path is called VPC Plus. Same feature, but we create what we call a virtual switch to produce the same type of uh, fake load balance. So we, we put the virtual switch, the, the VPC Plus switches, as four digits. This is just to make it easier to you to find which type of devices is presented on your MAC address table, okay? I'm going fast on, uh, on uh, Fabric Path because this is just give you a, a path on the evolution. Fabric Path, it's only Cisco devices. You can run, the, uh, run it on Nexus 5Ks, Nexus 7Ks as well. So that's the, 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 the path to evolution, bringing fabric path, okay? Of course, some best practice, manual switch ID assignment. And why I'm putting manual switch ID and I put this as a star here. As fabric path is really easy to configure, you just need this guy's feature set, feature, and configure the VLANs and the fabric port is going to work. You don't need to set the priority. You don't need to set the switch ID. It's going to be auto assigned. But, but as a best practice, you enable you menu configure switch ID. You configure multi destination tree. So this is the MDT tree that I was mentioning. The spines normally you put as the best, as a better priority. So you make sure that those guys will be always the responsible to manage all the fabric path tree. Uh, between leaf and spine. Put port channels. If you need to expand, it's much easier. And of course, uh, some good white paper explaining fabric path. We got to the second polling questions. I just want to understand what you guys have in your network. Okay. Which devices do you have on the data center? Catalyst switches? Any catalyst? Uh, if you have Nexus, 2K, 3K, 5K, 6K, I put 7K separated because 7K you can run OTV, you can run uh, VDCs. If you have 9K running standalone or Nexus ACI, which would be 9K in ACI, putting them separated also. Just go back to your QA panelist. Please answer this, it's going to help us to on the next steps and creating some next training also. So VXLAN is an open standard uh, technology. So it's not only Cisco devices that can run VXLAN. Uh, also uses cross topology. So same thing running the, the spine, uh, leaf spine leaf traffic. It's always directly connected. Uh, you, uh, you always have a spine leaf spine traffic. And it's what we called MAC and UDP encapsulation. Okay, so put this way, all the traffic on your VXLAN network, it's going to be encapsulated on a UDP packet. 
It doesn't matter if it's IPv4 or IPv6, it's going to be encapsulated. Uh, what do you have as layer two scalability? Remember what when we called multi-tenancy. Okay, multi-tenancy means a data center with multiple devices, multiple environments, multiple customers. Uh, this can, and trust me, it can happen when we grow a lot. The 4,000 limit of VLANs, you're going to reach it easily. Okay, so VXLearn avoids that and we grow to a point of 16 million unique layer two segments. Okay, so we have ECMP traffic also, so multipath, uh, no, link, no block, blocked links in the core. Uh, we also have the same MAC address table consumption redu uh, reduction, so we don't need to advertise our MAC address to all the switches. Just the ones that knows that needs that can we're going to, is going to be aware of that MAC address. We have what we call AnyCast gateway. Okay, so imagine you have I'm putting here four leaf switches as an example. Imagine if you have ten. 20, 50 leaf switches. Uh, so first things first, why 50 switches? How can I get 550 leaf switches? If you have a data center with 50 racks and you're using top of rack switches, you can put each of these switch as a leaf. So instead of having the traffic going from the server to the leaf on top of the rack, go into the core and come back to the rack uh, and expanding this, you can have the, the, the direct the layer three layer level, let's say, the encapsulation running on the TAR switch. So any cast means the gateway, like the 10.1.1.1 slash 24, the default gateway, you're going to have the same IP on all TAR switches. You don't need to send the traffic through your fabric up to your router and then send back to the same tour if you need a different layer three device, a different layer three network. So this is what AnyCast Gateway allows us to do. Okay. Some terminology is going to make it easier to us. VXLAN, virtual extensible, extensible LAN. The VNED is what brings us to 16 million. Uh, I, I'm saying like VLANs, it's just a layer two segment, so some Time people who say that it's VLAN, but it's not VLAN, it's a layer two segment, similar to VLAN. Uh, you will not be able to, con to confuse between them because VLAN goes up to 4000K and VXLAN, the VNED, they start at 4000K, so it's really something that you avoid uh, confusing, you won't be able to, to confuse. You have the NDE device, which is the device that's going to be encapsulating the traffic, so receiving the traffic in classical Ethernet here, and then encapsulating it and sending it to the fabric. So this is what we call NDE. We have the NVE interface. So NVE interface is going to be the interface of the NDE that will be creating the tunnels between the guys, so all these devices. And edge devices, and that's the great thing about VXLAN. You can do VXLAN on network devices, so the switches. Uh, you can do on the hosts, so you can create tunnels. You can do this encapsulation directly on a VM. You can run this hybrid. You can establish this tunnel between a VM and an edge device. And if you see here, we are saying a lot about overlays. Okay. And I didn't see any questions, so I'll answer right away. Here you have underlay. Okay. Remember, we are talking about encapsulation. And I'm saying that the core will give you know, doesn't need to know what is being carried within the packet. You just need reachability between the ND devices. So 
you need to configure an underlay network. And normally what you do is you have any IGP running, it can be ISIS, can be OSPF, running as an underlay network. And on top of that, you create what we call the overlay network, which will really be the fabric. So all the encapsulation will be running on top of the overlays. You can be a network overlay, can be a host overlay, or can be a hybrid overlay. Okay. Just some examples here and uh, virtual endpoints, and we get to what I prefer to shoot you is exactly, oops, got to the point of this, sorry. Uh, so when we talk about network overlays, we have the excellent running, we have fabric path, we have list, VPLS, OTV, host overlay, we have VXLAN or, or NVGRE, but most of the companies will be running hybrid overlays. And I'll show you one example of this in a moment. A little bit of big bite talk. All the packets are encapsulated, so the core will see a packet like this, okay? When your VTAP or ND device sends the, the packet and encapsulates the device, you, it, it's going to get the original layer two frame Add the VXLAN right header, which is the VNI, the, the, the VLAN, so you see VLAN, the AKA VLAN, uh, so up to 60 million numbers. It's going to add a new DP header, so just basically the source port of this, no, for UDP, we use port 4789 for the VXLAN traffic. Outer IP header, and that's the important part. Your core doesn't need to know, uh, sorry, just need to know the VTAP addresses. I'm saying a lot of uh, names here, and I'm going to show it to you in the demo in a moment, so don't worry about it uh, if you don't get it the first time, okay? So the VTAP addresses are the NDE devices. Remember the NVE interfaces on the NDE devices. So VTAP addresses, are the ones that are going to be seen in the core on the overlay network, no, on the underlay network as source IP and destination IP. Uh, and of course the VLAN tag if you need that and MAC addresses. But for the core, just the two outer headers, the three outer headers are important. It doesn't need to understand the, the other things. Okay. Again, adding this because a lot of people want to see how is the packet, the, the packet structure and quick example, how the flow is going to happen and as I just described it to you guys. Server A connected to a VTAP to an ND device. It's going to send traffic to server B. Okay, so I send source MAC, my MAC, destination MAC, the MAC B, source IP, destination IP. So this is my inner header on the, of the packet, okay. Uh, as soon as I get this is running on the VXLAN part. So I add my VXLAN VNED. So I put 30,000. Uh, 30, uh, remember, it's not the same as VLAN. So VLAN goes up to 4,000. This starts on 4K also, uh, after, sorry. But my underlay network, just need to know which is my source of destination IP, which are the VTAP IPs. The underlay network doesn't care about the server IP. Okay. Send to the VTAP, the VTAP encapsulates, send to the other guy, receive the packet and encapsulate it and send to the server B. So this is just one quick example about how the VXLAN traffic will, is going to flow on your underlay network. And bringing back about the overlays, host based and network based, one thing that I want to mention here, like network based, we may have 3K, 5K, 7, all the Nexus devices. We can also run VXLAN on ASRs, 1K and 9K. Uh, host based, we can run on a Nexus 1000V or on a CSRV device. Just keep in mind, these guys, like why I would like to encapsulate the traffic on the CSRV, for example. 
So let's say you have your Nexus devices running your data center, your core switches, uh, your VTAP devices, and you want to extend this VLAN to a cloud, let's say Amazon or each other cloud that you have, that you prefer, you deploy a CSRV there, and through the tunnel, through the internet, or dedicated connect, any connection that you have with the, your private cloud, you can establish a VXLAN peer. Okay, so you can extend, you can virtualize, you can extend that between your data centers as well. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that you will be willing to run the, the whole space at VXLAN. These are the Cisco solutions, okay? And the best solution would be hybrid, so you combine both solutions depending on your need. Information, let's keep going. So this is just for, uh, the, how you advertise the MAC addresses. So you can use multicast, you can run unicast, you can run BGP, I'll show you in the demo quickly. Uh, so just this is just a script to have you there. Pre-requirements, layer tree reachability between the VTAPs, like I said, you're running your IGP. Uh, if you run VPC, you can also, you need to have it before. Multicast, if you're running, um, if you're using multicast for your boom, broadcast, uni unknown, multica uh, unknown unicast and multicast or BGP. A simple example, I'll show you on the demo directly. Enable features, map VLAN to VNI. Remember VLAN? This is just an idea, VLAN 30 to VLAN 30,000. VLAN 40 to VLAN 40,000, but you don't need to follow that. Same things, enabling features. Okay. Uh, I'll just jump this verification to directly to the demo. I think it's easier. Guys, you have here some documents also that you can use. Uh, join Cisco Live to find them after. Here's some troubleshooting tips. I'll add this on the demo. So just here to show to you uh, you have that on the PPT, but on the demo you can see that. I'll talk about that also. So demo. So this is our topology. Okay, we have two leaves. We have two spines with another two leaves. I'm going to play with the VLAN uh, 1502. Okay. So quickly go into the leaf switches. It's connecting again. Good. Lift switches and lift switches. Okay. So, for example, show run VLAN 15U2. I have this VLAN mapped to the VN V to the VN segment, so the VNID 10502. Uh, 10, okay. If I do show a spanning tree, and that's the funny part, if you learn 1502, you, you're going to see only PO1, which is the peer link, VPC peer link, and PO36, which is the link connected to the switch 36 here. I don't have spanning tree running on the uplinks. Okay? If I do show run VPC to show you the VPC configuration that I configured, you have the feature. You have these guys, pure link, some other tunings also, but you have the pure link configured, and one VPC. And if I do show VPC, as I said, guys, pure link is alive, success, everything. This is my primary device. VLANs running on the pure link status, and which VLANs are active on my VPC. And I have this VPC 36, which is this going in the bottom here. Uh, so let's jump to my 36, show run interface. One. 36 here. Show run interface VLAN 1502. And show run interface VLAN 1502. I'm going to grab this VLAN here. So this IP, I'll go to my other end, ping this guy, 
your F, give me your Q. Uh, awesome. Okay, host, give me your Q. Yep. So you see, I wasn't able to ping, but I ping it after. So this was my device first packet of uh, knowing how the things are going on the core and creating the tunnel. And how I know that, that it created a tunnel. So if I go here, show interface VLAN 1502, I have this MAC address. Back to my other host, show MAC address table, address this. I'm knowing this via port channel on the up uplink. So this is just simulating a host. When I go to my V need my uh, ND device, my VTAP device, show MAC address table, address this. Uh -huh. This is via NVE interface. Go into my virtual, my VX lamp here. Okay. If I do show NVE peers, I have this guy here. So NVE, what is NVE? Remember that I mentioned, this is the virtual link, this is the VTAP interface or the, v, the, 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 the encapsulation interface. I can run the discover via multicast. I can also run the discover via BGP. One question that I always uh, hear also is, can I make BGP and multicast? Yes, you can, as you can see here. The only thing is each VNI, so each VXLAN ID, can only be part of multicast or BGP. You cannot merge them. Okay, so if you're migrating for static multicast to BGP, which is also known as uh, BGP EVPN, you can get to that point. You can migrate VNI per VNI. Okay, so VXLAN, again, guys, no spinning running on the core. Okay, I'll open to questions. Uh, Joan, do you have any one that you want to, to share with us or? Uh, actually, I have one. Uh, actually, I have, we have two. Uh, <laughs> let me find here. It is, can we run MacSec over one or more VXLANs or must be run MacSec at the physical layer 2 port? <clears throat> Honestly, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I believe you can save that for after, right? I can okay. uh, I'll share with I'll share it in the forum after. Uh, just you know, just kept note of that of that. So show VPC again, guys. One thing that I want to show you this. Let's say you have problems with this. I know that I have a problem in this guy. Show VPC. We have pure VLAN consistency status failed. Okay, what I can do here is show VPC consistency parameters global, it's going to comp compare each type of parameter that is checked topic by topic between the peer devices. And then we get to the end that we have local suspended VLANs. So these VLANs are suspended. And if I go show interface, and you know, I know this already, but uh, you can check one by one. I can see that these VLANs are blocked on the VPC peer link. And it's because I'm not running spanning tree on this guy. And the, 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 these, inter these VLANs are not up. So with the consistency parameters, you can check exactly why it's not forming, why, what is the issue that you have between them. And you go simple to spanning tree MSD or how the, the spanning tree is configured. And that's it. Okay, guys. So just to let you know, I'll be keeping an eye on the forum 
the slides the slides will be shared with uh, with you guys uh via the the the, the, the form as well and if you have any questions, all the questions that were not that were not answered uh, live due to time, uh, like Ilda said in the beginning, it was a little bit long the presentation. <laughs> uh, feel free to contact me or Joel via the forum. Uh, we'll be following up this and answering those as fast as we can. Thank you very much, Thiago. Yeah, uh, this is uh, quite a lot of information. Uh, uh, still, some points to cover, but I think uh, you have done a great job of just presenting like. Lots of features in the whole data center evolution. So just to finish up, like with this uh, session, for those of, those of you who can't stay here right now, uh, we are going to read aloud some of the questions from the audience and answer a couple of them uh, before this event finishes. And it's not just as Tiago mentioned before, uh, all the questions, like even the ones we that you have with an answer and the ones that does not have an answer, you can find it in the community. So Tiago and Joe will be there on the forum just uh, helping to answer all these questions. If your question didn't get an answer today, it will have an answer in the upcoming days. Also, the recording will be available in the upcoming days of the community at the uh, event page, okay? So I'm gonna read just a couple of questions for you, Tiago, if you can help us out to reply to them. So the first one is, can you repeat what is the requirements or warnings of using management port for BPC PKL. Yep. So uh, let's when we have the VPC purely configuration and the, the put back this slide. It's easy. So when we have this and we configure the peer link here and the peer keep alive link, uh, you need to make sure that one peer device is able to reach the other one. Uh, in separated ways because let's say you have a failure on the peer link, port channel is down, cable is bad, or you have a failure on the interface directly. Uh, to avoid split brain, to avoid both devices seeing each other as down, but they, they won't be down, it's just the peer link that is down. The peer keep alive link needs to be on a separate interface. So you have different uh, spot like single point of failure. Okay. So the other question, thank you, the other question that we have here is just like, what will happen if the BPC peer link goes down between the switch? Yep, so VPC peer link, when it's down, uh, the primary device is going to shut down all the VPC links on the secondary device. Uh, as it has reachability via VPC peer link, uh, sorry, VPC keep alive link, is going to say, hey, shut down your side because we lost our communication. Uh, it's better to keep me as the primary uh, to be full active for the traffic. Uh, one thing that we need to pay attention to this is for the orphan ports that are, that are only connected on the secondary box, they will also uh, be put down. So as a best practice, orphan ports connect to the primary device. When we and when the VPC peer link is back online, uh, the, the VPC ports will be back online also. Okay, uh, thank you. So then, uh, what happens if the OFAN port is configured to use the VLAN uh, and is also on the VPC trunk? Uh, so that 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 would be like the orphan port being used uh, being in, being used as a orphan port. Like yeah, it's we, we can confuse uh, yeah. config yeah. Yeah, we can confuse the trunk ports with VPC ports or port channel ports. So the orphan port can be uh, port channel, uh, sorry, can be trunk or not. The only thing is if it's up uh, and using a VPC VLAN, and in, if we have an issue with the peer link, when it's connected to the secondary port, it's going to be down. So that, that's the issue of the orphan port. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tiago, and thank you very much for everybody who joined to this event. Uh, I'm glad all of you guys are here, and thank you very much, Tiago and Joao. Joao, you have been doing a great job answering all the questions for the, for the from the audience. Thank you very much, everyone from the audience who are just here with us today. We are going to close down this session, and just give me just a couple of, uh, of moments. I I need just to restart this. 
But thank you for everyone for joining here, and thank you very much for being with us today. All the questions that didn't have an answer, um, we were not able to finish them up. They will be available in the community, so as the recording will be available in the upcoming days. So thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you, guys. Very much, really appreciate your time. Okay, so just to conclude to this session, I just want to wrap it up. For all of you, like all the questions will be here on the forum. You can find them on the community. They will be available to the. May 25th. Uh, also, you can find further information about uh, the community and the social media channels that we have. That we communicate everything about our further events, about everything we uh, we're going to have in the community, including the fusion with Cisco communities. All the information will be available there as well, as long as in the community. For those of you who speak in a different language rather than English, you can find our local communities in Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, or Russian. There we have uh, special events like this on the local languages. And we also manage uh, documents, videos, or blogs. For you who are looking for further training, we invite you to have a look to the Cisco Learning Network webinars and seminars. They have a lot of further IT training that can help you out to boost your IT career. And for all of you, uh, we have a survey coming out just when this event finishes up. And for all of you who fill it out, you will be able to redeem a 35% discount of the Cisco press, okay? So for you to fill out this uh, survey, it not only helps us out to identify what kind of events you would like to see, what kind of topics you would like us to manage, but also you will be able to redeem a 35% discount on Cisco press for all of you who redeem and give this uh, survey. Well, once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I wish you have a, a great time and a great day, and thank you very much once again, Tiago and Joao and everybody here. We wish you have a great time and we hope to see you on the upcoming webcast event. Thank you.